Now out here in California, you see John Muir's name on pretty much everything. Not many people realize that his first long through hike was not through any place that most of us these days would consider exotic. It was through the American South, starting in Louisville, Kentucky, traveling through the Cumberland Gap, and pretty much following the route that Grant took in Rosecrans when they finished off the Confederates on their march to the sea. I think, uh, I think uh, John Muir went all the way to Florida, and Florida at the time was, was kind of uh, being newly discovered by a lot of uh, America. They had a pretty stalwart Confederate regiment, and uh, during the Jackson Wars, well, that was adjacent to the Seminole Wars, and um, one of the fiercest Native nations was the Seminole Nation, and, and the Americans defeated the Natives during those wars, and so Florida was becoming heavily colonized by this point, and folks were just discovering alligators and things like that. Um, but John Muir being uh, a man of the wilderness and a uh, professional auditor of nature, basically, uh, a biologist, a geologist, a man who would catalog every life form, flora and fauna on a mountain at every 500 yards and could tell you what grows at this strata and what grows at this strata and when this strata developed and when this strata developed. And in, in addition to John Muir's words being uh, cutting-edge science for his time, he, um, he also has a lot of beautiful poetry and mysticism and winsome human observations that makes him such a lovable character he is. Um, I come across uh, his journal, John Muir's journal of his trip through the South, in researching my own ancestor, Captain Bill Strong the uh, leader of the Red String Raiders, a kind of um, uh, an abolitionist regiment that later fought under Rosecrans and Willich. Um, and they were pretty much um, already in force as a sort of anti-fascist gang even before the Civil War started, liberating plantations and brothels before the Union Army even got there and fighting in some of the first battles uh, at Camp Wildcat and... Uh, such. But there's a pretty good chance that when John Muir mentions a mountain a, a mountain regiment, this is just post-Civil War, that kind of stopped him on the road and he, he just kind of whistled and walked through, um, there's a very good chance that that was Captain Bill Strong and the Red String Raiders still doing cleanup after the Civil War, uh, making sure that the towns had American flags instead of Confederate flags flying on them, making sure that people weren't still using slave labor. And uh, the people who were had to pay for it. And uh, so it was a pretty rowdy gang. And, and John, the gang John Muir takes mention of near the Cumberland Gap, it was very likely the Red String Raiders. Because uh, that's where uh, Uncle Captain Billy's gang was active. Uh, also interesting to note that there was correspondence between John Muir and General Rosecrans, who was the head general over the uh, regiments from that part of Kentucky that would fight alongside uh, Willich's Indiana Regiment, which was entirely German immigrant socialist, who would later follow John Muir's trail and set up a socialist colony, an attempted socialist utopia called the Kawea Colony. And that is now verified enough in the historical document that you can easily find that in Wikipedia search on uh, the Sequoias, uh, the Sequoia National Park. In fact, before it was called the Sherman Tree, the largest tree in the world was called the Karl Marx Tree. I shit you not. It's historically documented. The largest tree in the world, the Karl Marx Tree. <laughs> okay, the president won't let us call it that. Okay, Sherman. He was, he was a kick-ass general. Give it to him. He should have called it the Willich Tree. Anyway, without further ado, here is the words of John Muir, undistilled as he traveled through the American South in the ashes of the Civil War.
September of 1869. I have seen oaks of many species and many kinds of exposure and soil, but those of Kentucky excel in grandeur all I had ever before beheld. They are broad and dense and bright green. In the leafy bowers and caves of their, of their long branches dwell magnificent avenues of shade, and every tree seems to be blessed with a double portion of strong, exulting life. Walked twenty miles, mostly on river bottom, found shelter in a rickety tavern. Let's see here. That rickety tavern could have very well been the former uh, brothel that Uncle Captain Billy and the Red String Raiders liberated and turned into an abolitionist outpost and part of the uh, Underground Railroad. So here he goes. Emerging about noon from a grove of giant sunflowers, I found myself on the brink of a tumbling rocky stream, Rolling Fork. I did not expect to find bridges on my wild ways and at once started to ford when a negro woman on the opposite bank earnestly called on me to wait until she could tell the men folks to bring me a horse that the river was too deep and rapid to wade and that I would cert certain me drowned if I attempted to cross. It's interesting, John Muir tries to write in the, uh, I guess, the pigeon ebonics of the time. Um, but interesting to document the the syntax that was used during that period. There might have been closer African linguistic ties. Who knows? Um, but it's certainly more of a patois, it sounds like. In a few minutes, the fairy horse came gingerly down the bank through vines and weeds. His long, stilt legs proved him a natural waiter. He was white, and the little sable negro boy that rode him looked like a bug on his back. After many a tottering halt, the outward voyage was safely made, and I mounted behind little the, the little boy. He was a queer specimen, puffy and jet as an India rubber doll, and his hair was matted in sections like the wool of a merino sheep. The old horse, overladen with his black and white burden, rocked and stumbled on his stilt legs with fair promises of a fall. But all ducking signs failed, and we arrived in safety among the weeds and vines of the rugged bank. A salt bath would have done us no harm, I could swim in little Af and and little Afri the little African boy looked as if he might float like a bladder. I called at the homestead where my ferryman informed me I would find tolerable water, but like all the water of the section that I have tasted, it was intolerable with salt. Everything about this old Kentucky home bespoke plenty, unpolished and unmeasured. The house was built a true southern style, airy, large, with a transverse central hall that looks like a railway tunnel and a heavy rough outside chimneys. The Negro quarters and other buildings are enough in number for a village, altogether an interesting representative of a genuine old Kentucky home, embosomed in orchards, cornfields, and green wooded hills. September 6th. Started at the earliest bird song, in hopes of seeing the great mammoth cave before evening, overtook an old Negro driving an ox team rode with him a few miles and had some interesting chat concerning war, wild fruits of the woods, etc. Right here, said he, is where the Rebs was a tearing up the track and they all of a sudden thought they see the Yankees a coming. Oh, by them big hills down. Lord, how they run. I asked him if he would like a renewal of these sad war times when his flexible face suddenly calmed and he said with intense earnestness, Oh, Lord, won't no more. Oh, Lord, no. Many of these Kentucky... Negroes are shrewd and intelligent, and when warmed up on a, and when warmed upon a subject that interests them, are eloquent in no mean degree. Arrived at Horse Cave, about ten miles from the Great Cave, the entrance is by a long, easy slope of several hundred yards. It seems like a noble gateway to the birthplace of springs and fountains and the dark treasures of the mineral kingdom. This cave is in a village of the same name, which it supplies with an abundance of cold water and cold air that issues from its fern-clad lips. In hot weather, crowds of people sit about it in the shade of the trees that guard it. This magnificent fan is capable of cooling everybody in the town at once. It's interesting to think that the cave being the center of civic life in that particular small town, it's, it's very primitive, it's beautiful. I bet they had some beautiful singing sessions in there. Started for Glasgow Junction, got belated in the hill woods, inquired my way at a farmhouse and was invited to stay overnight 
in a rare, hearty, hospitable manner. Engaged in familiar running talk on politics, war times, and theology, the old Kentuckians seemed to take a liking to me and advised me to stay in these hills until next spring, assuring me that I would find much to interest me in and about the great cave, also that he was one of the school officials and was sure that I could obtain their school for the winter term. I sincerely thanked him for his kind plans, but pursued my own. September 7th. Left the hospitable Kentuckians with their sincere good wishes and bore away southward again through the deep green woods. In noble forests all day saw mistletoe for the first time. Part of the day I traversed with a Kentuckian from Burksville. He spoke to all the Negroes he met with, familiar kindly greetings, addressing them always as uncles and aunts. All travelers one meets on these roads, white and black, male and female, travel on horseback. Glasgow is one of the few southern towns that shows ordinary American life at night with the well-to-do farmer. September 8th. Deep green, bossy sea of waving, flowing hilltops. Corn and cotton and tobacco fields scattered here and there. I had imagined that a cotton field in flower was something magnificent, but cotton is a coarse, rough, straggling, unhappy-looking plant, not half as good-looking as a field of Irish potatoes. Met a great many Negroes going to meeting, dressed in their Sunday best, fat, happy-looking, content. The scenery on approaching the Cumberland River becomes still grander. Burksville, a beautiful location, is embosomed in a glorious array of verdant flowing hills. The Cumberland must be a happy stream. I think I could enjoy traveling with it in the midst of such beauty all my life. This evening I could find none willing to take me in, so lay down on a hillside and fell asleep muttering praises to the happy abounding beauty of Kentucky. This is certainly the part between the Kentucky River and the Cumberland River where Uncle Captain Billy and the Red String Raiders were pretty much the abolitionist enforcers. And so I'm not surprised at all that that the, the black folks in this particular county seemed happy and at ease. September 9th. Another day in the most favored province of bird and flower. Many rapid streams flowing in beautiful flower-bordered cannons and blossomed in dense woods. I am seated on a ground on a grand hill slope that leans back against the sky like a picture. Amid the wide waves of green woods there are spots of autumnal yellow and the atmosphere too has the dawnings of autumn in colors and sounds. The soft light of morning falls upon ripening forests of oak and elm, walnut and hickory, and all nature is thoughtful and calm. Kentucky is the greenest, leafiest state I have yet seen. The sea of soft, temperate plant green is deepest here. Comparing volumes of vegetable verdure in different countries to a wedge, the thick end would be in the forests of Kentucky, the other in the lichens and mosses of the north. This verdure wedge would not be perfect in its lines, from Kentucky, it would maintain its thickness long and well in passing the level forests of Indiana and Canada. From the maples and pines of Canada, it would slope rapidly to the bleak Arctic hills with dwarf, birch dwarf birches and alders. Thence, it would thin out and long edge among hardy lichens and liverworts and mosses to the dwelling places of everlasting frost. Far the grandest of all Kentucky plants are her noble oaks. They are the master existences of her exuberant forests. Here is the Eden, the paradise of oaks. Pass the Kentucky line towards evening and obtain food and shelter from a thrifty Tennessee farmer after he had made use of all the ordinary empty hospitable arguments of cautious, comfortable families. It's interesting. This is a the John Muir that had not yet seen the sequoias, or possibly didn't even know of their existence. much less the Alaska archipelagos, which he explored, and I find those writings to be some of his grandest. I uh, have one of the chapters recorded here in my YouTubes. I'm sure you can find it if you just look for Alaska archipelago, John Muir. Anyway, I guess Kentucky was even more beautiful back then. September 10th. Escape from a heap of uncordial kindness to the generous bosom of the woods. After a few miles of level ground and luxuriant tangles of brooding vines, I begin the ascent of the Cumberland Mountains. The first real mountains that my fo foot ever touched or eyes beheld. The ascent was by a nearly regular zigzag slope, mostly covered up like a tunnel by overarching oaks. But there were a few openings where the glorious forest road of Kentucky was grandly seen, stretching over hill and valley, 
adjusted to every slope and curve by the hands of nature, the most sublime and comprehensive picture that ever entered my eyes. Reached the summit in six or seven hours, a strangely long period of upgrade work to one accustomed only to the hillocky levels of Wisconsin and adjacent states. Traveled a few miles with an old Tennessee farmer who was much excited on account of the news he had just heard. Three kingdoms, England, Ireland, and Russia, have declared war again the United States. Oh, it's terrible, terrible, said he. This big war coming so quick after our own big fight. Well, can't be helped. All I have to say is, America forever, and not a leap rather than they didn't fight. But are you sure the news is true? I inquired. Oh, yes, quite sure, he replied. For me and some of my neighbors were down at the store last night, and Jim Smith can read, and he found out all about it in the newspaper. I passed the poor, rickety, thrice-dead village of Jamestown, an incredibly dreary place. Toward the top of the Cumberland grade, about two hours before sundown, I came to a log house. Let me interrupt just to point out that it's so interesting that the same type of disinformation that's happening in the Trump era was happening in the Confederate era. Um, these were the same dullards that were talked into fighting for the glories of Dixie so that their rich cousin Chads could continue to exploit slave labor. Kind of like now. It's the uh, 3%, the 1%, the business class, exploiting the, the blue collars who think that they're somehow patriots for aligning themselves with white nationalists and people that have been our enemies in two separate wars. Where was I? Knocking at the door, a motherly old lady, it's a log cabin, replied to my request for supper and bed and breakfast, that I was welcome to the best she had, provided that I had the necessary change to pay my bill. When I told her that, unfortunately, I had nothing smaller than a five-dollar greenback, she said, Well, I'm sorry, but cannot afford to keep you. Not long ago, ten soldiers came across from North Carolina, and in the morning they offered a greenback that I couldn't change, and so I got nothing for keeping them, and which I was ill-able to afford. Very well, I said. I'm glad you spoke of this beforehand, for I would rather go hungry than impose on your hospitality. As I turned to leave, after bidding her goodbye, she evidently pitying me for my tired looks, called me back and asked me if I would like a drink of milk. This I gladly accepted, thinking that perhaps I might not be successful in getting any other nourishment for a day or two. Then I inquired whether there were any more houses on the road nearer than North Carolina, forty or fifty miles away. Yes, she said. It's only two miles to the next house, but beyond that there are no houses that I know of except empty ones whose owners have been killed or driven away during the war. Arriving at the last house, my knock at the door was answered by a bright, good-natured, good-looking little woman who, in reply to my request for a night's lodging and food, said, Oh, I guess so. I think you can stay. Come in and... My husband... But I must first warn you, I said... But, but I must first warn you, I said, that I have nothing smaller to offer you than a five-dollar bill for my entertainment. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to impose on your hospitality. She then called her husband, a blacksmith, who was at work at his forge. He came out, hammer in hand, bare-breasted, sweaty, bell-grimed, and covered with shaggy black hair. In reply to his wife's statement that his young man wished to stop overnight, he quickly replied, That's all right. Tell him to go into the house. He was turning to go back to his shop when his wife added but he says he hasn't any change to pay he has nothing smaller than a five dollar bill hesitating only a moment he turned on his heel and said tell him to go to the house a man that comes right out like that beforehand is welcome to eat my bread when he came in after his hearty day's work and sat down at dinner he solemnly asked a blessing on a frugal meal consisting solely of cornbread and bacon then looking across the table at me he said young man what are you doing down here i replied that i was looking at plants Plants? What kind of plants? I said. Oh, all kinds. Grass, weeds, flowers, trees, mosses, ferns, almost everything that grows is interesting to me. Well, young man, he queried, you mean to say you are not employed by the government on some private business? No, I said. I'm not employed by anyone except just myself. I love all kinds of plants, and I come down here to these southern states to get acquainted with as many of them as possible. You look well, you look like a strong-minded man, he replied, and surely you are able to do something better than wander over the country and look at weeds and blossoms. These are hard times. Real work's required of every man that's able. Picking up blossoms don't seem to be a man's work at all in any kind of times. 
in any kind of terms. To this I replied, You are a believer in the Bible, yes? Are you not? Well, you know, Solomon was a strong-minded man, and he's generally believed to have been the very wisest man the world ever saw. And yet he considered it was worth while to study plants, not only to go and pick them up, as I am doing, but to study them. And you know, we are told that he wrote a book about plants, not only of the great cedars of Lebanon, but of little bits of things growing in the cracks of the walls. Therefore, you see, the Solomon differed very much more from you than from me in this matter. I'll warrant you, he had many a long ramble on the mountains of Judea, and had he been a Yankee, he, he would likely have visited every weed in the land. And again, do you not remember that Christ told his disciples to consider the lilies, how they grow, and compare their beauty with Solomon in all of his glory? Now whose advice am I to take, yours or Christ's? Christ says, consider the lilies. You say, don't consider the lilies. It isn't worthwhile for any strong-minded man. This evidently satisfied him, and he acknowledged that he had never thought of blossoms in that way before. He repeated again and again that I must be a very strong-minded man, and admitted that no doubt I was fully justified in picking up blossoms. He then told me that although the war was over, walking across the Cumberland Mountains still was far from safe, on account of small bands of gorillas who were in hiding along the roads, and earnestly entreated me to turn back and not to think of walking so far as the Gulf of Mexico until the country became quiet and orderly once more. I replied that I had no fear, that I had but very little to lose, and that nobody was going to think it worthwhile to rob me, that anyhow I always had good luck. In the morning he repeated the warning and entreated me to turn back, which never for a moment interfered with my resolution to pursue my glorious walk. Towards sundown, as I was walking rapidly along a straight stretch in the road, I suddenly came in sight of ten mounted men, riding abreast. They undoubtedly had seen me before I had discovered them, for they had stopped their horses and were evidently watching me. I saw at once that it was useless to attempt to avoid them, for the ground thereupon was quite open. I knew that there was nothing for it but to face them fearlessly, without showing the slightest suspicion of foul play. Therefore, without halting even for a moment, I advanced rapidly with long strides as though I intended to walk through the midst of them. When I got within a rod or so, I looked up in their faces and smilingly bade them, Howdy! Stopping never an instant, I turned to one side and walked around them to get on the road again and kept on without venturing to look back or to betray the slightest fear of being robbed. After I had gone about 100 or 150 yards, I ventured a quick glance back without stopping and saw in the flash of an eye that all the ten had turned their horses toward me and were evidently talking about me, supposedly with reference to what my object was, where I was going, whether it would be worthwhile to rob me. They all were mounted on rather scrawny horses, and all wore long hair hanging down on their shoulders. Evidently they belonged to the most irreclaimable of the guerrilla bands who, along accustomed to plunder, deplored the coming of peace. I was not followed, however, probably because the plants projecting from my plant press made them believe that I was a poor herb doctor, a common occupation in those mountain regions. About dark I discovered, a little off the road, another house inhabited by negroes, where I succeeded in obtaining a much-needed meal of string beans, buttermilk, and cornbread. At the table I was seated in a bottom bottomless chair, and as I became sore and heavy, I sank deeper and deeper. Where was I? Deeper and deeper, pressing my knees against my breast, and my mouth settled to the level of my plate. But wild hunger cares for none of these things, and my curiously compressed position prevented the too free indulgence of boisterous appetite. Of course, I was compelled to sleep with the trees in the one great bedroom of the open night. September 19th. Received another solemn warning of dangers on my way through the mountains was told by my worthy entertainer of a wondrous gap in the mountains which he advised me to see. It is called Track Gap, said he, from the great number of tracks on the rocks, bird tracks, bar tracks, hoss tracks, men tracks, all on the solid rock as if it had been mud. Bidding farewell to my worthy mountaineer and all his comfortable wonders, I pursued my way to the south. As I was leaving, he repeated the warnings of dangers ahead saying that there were a good many people living like wild beasts on whatever they could steal, 
and that murders were sometimes committed for four or five dollars and even less. While stopping with him, I noticed that a man came regularly after dark to the house for a supper. He was armed with a gun, a pistol, a long knife. My host told me that this man was at feud with one of his neighbors and that they were prepared to shoot one another on sight that neither of them could do any regular work or sleep in the same place two nights in succession, that they had visited houses only for food, and as soon as the one that I saw had got his supper, he went out and slept in the woods. Without, of course, making a fire, his enemy did the same. My entertainer told me that he was trying to make peace between these two men because they both were good men, and if they would agree to stop their quarrel, they could then go to work. Most of the food in this house was coffee without sugar, cornbread, sometimes bacon, but the coffee was the greatest luxury with these people. The only way of obtaining it was by seizing skins, or in particular, sang, that is, ginseng four, which found a market in far-off China. If I may make it aside, who would have thought an underground ginseng market would have been so big in the Appalachians of Kentucky, right after the Civil War? Fascinating ginseng. I guess uh, plant medicine people knew it. Mr. Cameron told me that when I arrived, he tried me for a mason and found that I was not a mason. He, and finding that I was not a mason, he wondered still more that I would venture into the country without being able to gain the assistance of brother masons in these troubled times. Young man, he said, after hearing my talks on... Young man, he said, after hearing my talks on botany... I see that your hobby is botany, and my hobby is electricity. I believe that the time is coming that we may not live to see it when that mysterious power or force used now only for telegraphy will eventually supply the power for running railroad trains and steamships for lightning, and in a word, electricity will do all the work of the world. I gazed awe-stricken as one knew a ride from another world. Bonaventure is called a graveyard, a town of the dead, but the few graves are powerless in such a depth of life, the rippling of living waters, the songs of birds, the joyous confidence of flowers, the calm, undisturbable grandeur of the oaks. Mark this place of graves as one of the Lord's most favored abodes of light and life. Let me make another aside. Life and light are part of the LVX salute in most intermasonic orders and Rosicrucian orders from which they sprang. Um, and it's interesting that the man talking about the power of electricity as like the foundation of of all life in the universe and, and harnessing that power. That was the way that alchemists and alchemists Alchemists within the Masonic orders were talking in those days about these kind of inventions, um, and uh, far from kind of the the tired reductionist way of looking at science these days. Um, but the Masons were the cutting edge thinkers. They weren't they weren't bound by the fundamentalism of most of the people around them. Let's see. On no subject are our ideas more warped and pitiable than on death. Instead of the sympathy, the freedom, the friendly union of life and death so apparent in nature, we are taught that death is an accident, a deplorable punishment for the oldest sin, the arch enemy of life, etc. Town children especially are steeped in, his death, in this death orthodoxy, for the natural beauties of death are seldom seen or taught in towns. Of death among our own species, to say nothing of the thousand styles and modes of murder, our best memories, even among happy deaths, yield groans and tears, mingled with morbid exultation. Burial companies, black and cloth and countenance, and last of all, a black box burial in an ill-omened place, haunted by imaginary glooms and ghosts of every degree. Thus death becomes fearful, and the most notable and incredible thing heard around a deathbed is, I fear not to die. But let children walk with nature. Let them see the beautiful blendings and communions of death and life, their joyous inseparable unity, as taught in woods and meadows, plains and mountains, and streams of our blessed star. And they will learn that death is stingless indeed, and as beautiful as life, and that the grave has no victory 
for it never fights. All is divine harmony. LVX. There, thought I, is an ideal place for a penniless wanderer. There, no superstition, no, stu no superstitious prowling mischief maker dares venture for fear of haunting ghosts, while for me there will be God's rest and peace. And then, if I am to be exposed to unhealthy vapors, I shall have capital, capital, capital compensation in seeing those grand oaks in the moonlight, with all the impressive and nameless influences of this lonely, beautiful place. All is enclosed by a black iron railing composed of rigid bars that might have been spears or bludgeons from a battlefield in pandemonium. It is interesting to observe how assiduously nature seeks to remedy these labored art blunders. She corrodes the iron and marble and gradually levels a hill which is always heaped up as if a sufficiently heavy quantity of clods could not be laid on the dead. Arching grasses come one by one. Seeds come flying on downy wings, silent as fate, to give life's dearest beauty for the ashes of art. And strong evergreen arms laden with ferns and tillandsia drapery are spread over all. Life, I was very thirsty after walking so long in the muggy heat, a distance of three or four miles from the city to get to this graveyard. A dull, sluggish, coffee-colored stream flows under the road just outside the graveyard garden park, from which I managed to get a drink after breaking away down to the water through a dense fringe of bushes, daring the snakes and alligators in the dark. Thus refreshed, I entered the weird and beautiful abode of the dead. I work everywhere, obliterating all memory of the confusion of man. I was very thirsty after walking so long in the muggy heat, a distance of three or four miles from the city, to get to this graveyard. A dull, sluggish, coffee-colored stream flows under the road just outside the graveyard garden park, from which I managed to get a drink after breaking away, down to the water through a dense fringe of bushes, daring the snakes and alligators in the dark. Thus refreshed, I entered the weird and beautiful abode of the dead. Next day I returned to the town and was disappointed as usual in obtaining money, so after spending the next day looking at the plants in the gardens of the finest residences in town squares, I returned to my graveyard home, that I might not be observed and suspected of hiding, as if I had committed a crime. I always went home after dark, and one night as I lay down in my moss nest, I felt some cold-blooded creature in it, whether a snake or simply a frog or toad I did not know, but instinctively, instead of drawing back my hand, I grasped the poor creature and threw it over the tops of the bushes. That was the only significant disturbance or fright that I got. In the morning, everything seemed divine. Only squirrels, sunbeams, and birds came about me. I was awakened every morning by these little singers. After they discovered my nest, instead of serenely singing their morning songs, they at first came within two or three feet of the hut, and looking in at me through the leaves, chattered and scolded in half-angry, half-wondering tones. The crowd constantly increased, attracted by the disturbance. Thus I began to get acquainted with my bird neighbors in the blessed wilderness, and after they learned that I meant them no ill, they scolded less and sang more. In the morning everything seemed divine. After five days of this graveyard life, I saw that even with living on three or four cents a day, my last 25 cents would soon be spent, and after trying again and again unsuccessfully to find some employment, I began to think that I must strike further out into the country, but still within reach of town, until I came to some grain or rice field that had not yet been harvested, trusting that I could live indefinitely on toasted or raw corn or rice. By this time I was becoming faint, and in making the journey to the town was alarmed to find myself growing staggery and giddy, to ground, the ground ahead seemed to be rising up in front of me, and the little, the little streams and the ditches on the sides of the road seemed to be flowing uphill. Then I realized that I was becoming dangerously hungry and became more than ever anxious to receive that money package. Makes one wonder if uh, John Muir might have been introduced to the herb of the, uh, the Masonic uh, herbs. The grass of the Egyptians. Let's see. Giddiness, indeed. 
To my, to my delight, this fifth or sixth morning, when I inquired if the money package had come, the clerk replied that it had, but that he could not deliver it without my being identified. I said, well, here, read my brother's letter, handing it to him. It states the amount of the package where it came from the day it was put into the office at Pork and Chitty. I should think that would be enough. He said, no, that's not enough. How do you know that this letter is, how do I know that this letter is yours? You may have stolen it. How do I know that you're John Muir? I said, well, don't you see that this letter indicates that I am a botanist? For any my brother says, I hope you're having a good time and finding many new plants. Now you say I might have stolen this letter from John Muir and the way have become aware that there being a money package to arrive from Porkish from him, for him, but the letter proves that John Muir must be a botanist. And though, as you say, this letter might have been stolen, it would hardly be likely that the robber would be able to steal John Muir's knowledge of botany. Now I suppose, of course, that you have been to school and know something of botany. Examine me and see if I know anything about it. At this he laughed good-naturedly, and evidently feeling the force of my argument, perhaps pitying me on account of looking pale and hungry, turned and rapped at the door of a private office, probably the manager's, calling him out and said, Mr. So-and-so, here's a man who's inquired every day for the last week or so for a money package from Portage, Wisconsin. He's a stranger in the city with no one to identify him. He states correctly the amount and the name of the sender. He's shown me a letter which indicates that Mr. Muir is a botanist and that although a traveling companion may have stolen Mr. Muir's letter, he cannot have stolen his botany and requests us to examine him. The heady official smiled, took a stare in the, into my face, waved his hand and said, Ah, uh, let him have it. Gladly I pocketed my money and had not gone along the street more than a few rods before I met a very large Negro woman with a tray of gingerbread in which I immediately invested some of my new wealth and walked rejoicingly, munching along the street, making no attempt to conceal the pleasure I had in eating. Then still hunting for more food, I found a sort of eating place in a market and had a large regular meal on top of the gingerbread. Thus my marching through Georgia terminated handsomely in a jubilee of bread. The traces of war are not only apparent on the broken fields, burnt fences, mills, and woods ruthlessly slaughtered, but also on the count countenances of the people. A few years after a forest had been burned, another generation of bright and happy trees arise in purest, freshest vigor. Only the oldest trees, holy or half-dead, bear marks of the calamity. So with the good people of this war field, Happy, unscarred, and unclouded youth is growing up around the aged, half-consumed and fallen parents who bear in sad measure the ineffaceable marks of the farthest reaching and most infernal of all civilized calamities. And I think, I think that's, I think that was it on John Muir's journal, at least uh, the parts that I could obtain. Wow. What a lovely story.